Hi, my name is Sam Woods. I'm a full-time tour leader for Tropical Birding Tours and welcome to today's tour, the Alaska Virtual Tour in the United States. Uh, just introduce you to the characters on the slide here before we move on to the next uh, details. Uh, we've got horned and tufted puffins on the top row. I'm sorry, but I'm blocking a beautiful cub black bear with my mug. Uh, and then we've got willow ptarmigan, Stella's Ida, and then some nice flowers on the right because Alaska is in bloom at the time of year we knew we didn't normally do this. So moving on to where Alaska is, of course, some people watching this may not be from North America. It's right on the far northwest. It's uh, well above the lower 48 attached to Canada. Uh, this tour, just to let you know, is a two week tour with an extension uh, to make it a bit longer than that to the Pribilof Islands or St. Paul. Actually, that is the island we go to in that, those islands. So it, the tour starts in Anchorage and ends in Anchorage. Uh, we have a single night at the beginning in Anchorage. And then we move south and go to Seward for two nights where I'm circling here. We do a boat trip on the Kenai Fords. Uh, then we come back to Anchorage for another night before flying to Nome for four nights, which is a nice space to settle in. Uh, then we have to fly back to Anchorage again and have another night there. And then we fly up to Barrow, where the northernmost point in North America is Point Barrow. Uh, we spend three nights up at Barrow before flying back to Anchorage uh, and having a final night there if you're not going on the extension. If you continue on the extension, the next day we fly to St. Paul for three nights for a seabird bonanza. And this is the state flag of Alaska on the lower right. So one thing I should mention is Alaska, of course, is in the Arctic. So it's at this time of year, we, we sorry, I should say we do it in the summer. It has a very brief uh, manic breeding season. So the best times to go is kind of late May into June. Um, not much later than that if you want to do what we're doing, looking for most of the breeders in their spring refinery. Um, the birds breed very rapidly and then move on out. So um, while there is birds beyond that, that's a really good time for getting the things at the height of their breeding process. Um, and um, there are fairly various groups that are, are really uh, prominent there, this being loons being one of them. You can get all five loons on this trip. He has all five world species of loon. This is Pacific loon. And then we got the more, well, the well-named common loon, which is the most regular one seen on the trip. And I can't go by this image without playing you the call because it's one of the most haunting, evocative sounds of Alaska. So over to the common loon. And so here's one of the other great groups, the ducks. We've got the spectacled eider on the top left, the Stella's eider on the top right, king eider on the bottom left, and long-tailed ducks. These are all seen regularly around the barrow section of the trip, the most uh, northernmost point and uh, the most arctic feeling part of the trip. Shorebirds, of course, feature really well. Now, you may not like shorebirds particularly. A lot of people aren't big fans. But when you see them close up on the breeding grounds, making all these funky noises they don't normally make, uh, looking at their best and being within well within photographic range, uh, you might change your mind. Seabird sensation. This is a great trip for seabirds, particularly, I would say, on the last leg, uh, part four, on the extension on the Pribilofs, where all of these um, photos are taken on the island of St. Paul. And it's also a good place for mammals. Um, you've got chance of bears, uh, like this grizzly. Uh, you've got a chance of otters, sea otters, um, marmots, ground squirrels, um, lots of different mammals, uh, muskox, a caribou. So yes, it's a good trip for mammals, good trip for natural history with lots of flowers and an amazing trip for landscapes, of course, which is kind of synonymous with Alaska. Um, known as the last frontier or the grand land is another name. And I'm not a friend of the author or anything. I'm plugging this book because I genuinely think it's one of the best field guides I've ever used. And having 
not had this book uh, for a while and then seeing it and having not been to Alaska, this book made me want to go more than ever and I really enjoyed using it. So I highly recommend that. So talking about the routes, before we get into that, I just wanted to make clear Alaska's huge. Um, it's twice, the, it's the largest US state. It's twice the size of Texas, um, twice the size of Sweden, Europe, if, if you can relate to that. And I read a statistic that blew my mind that it's, um, it's also, if it was ranked as a country, it would be 17th largest in the world. So a huge place. And we cover a lot of ground on this trip uh, by taking flights uh, so we can cover different parts of it all in one two-week trip. Uh, a little bit over that when you take the extension to St. Paul. So yeah, so landscapes, birds, mammals, flowers, and I should say also it's a great trip for birders, photogra serious photographers and casual photographers too. You get a lot of photographs of this trip, not only of landscapes but of the animals you see. So yes, the, the tour starts in Anchorage and then we work our way south to the town of Seward for two nights. That's a drive of only about 120 miles, but a mega drive for birds and animals and scenery. So it'll be taken very slowly through the day on our first full birding day. Uh, it passes through scenic mountains where you can get things like dull sheep. It goes through you know, open landscapes like that where you can get things like marmots. And then it goes through coniferous forest where you can get birds like this varied thrush, which has one of the most amazing songs of uh, sort of characteristic songs of the coniferous forests of Alaska. So here it is, a beautiful varied thrush. Hope you enjoyed that varied thrush. Um, in the same forest, you can find things like chickadees and also this Townsend's warbler breeding. So even though we're quite well, very far north, we're in the Arctic, um, you still have some breeding warblers on this uh, tour, which is kind of nice. Um, the forest holds some scarcer birds in the coniferous forests as you get close to Seward. Um, you get American three-toed woodpecker and what's now called Canada Jay. Uh, recently had its name changed from Gray Jay. Um, so yes, so we look for those, look for kind of birds like that and even things like spruce grouse as you go to and from Anchorage, um, back and forth from Seward over these uh, next few days. So as I say, we, may, we go spend a day traveling from Anchorage to Seward, uh, a couple of hour drive, but taken through the day. And then we stay in Seward for two nights. And as you get towards Seward, um, I'll just take my mug off the screen here. As we approach Seward, there's some nice feeders on the edge of town with the local form of fox sparrow, sooty fox sparrow, pine grosbeak and red crossbill among others. And there's also a glacier called Exit Glacier you can walk to. And here's the town itself, Seward. So beautiful backdrop there. This is the harbor where boat trips go out of. And probably by the end of the day, we'll already be seeing a nice mammal like this sea otter, which often hang around the harbor. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool place to base Seward. Um, it's a town on the Kenai Peninsula. And our main reason for going there is to bird the area between Anchorage and there, a 120 mile stretch of road, uh, which is easy road birding. And then to do a boat trip out of Seward. Okay, so we've arrived in Seward, we've had our first night. And then the next full day, we spend the whole day on a boat, um, having meals on board and going through Resurrection Bay, which is on the edge of uh, Seward itself. Um, so we get on the boat and then we basically do sort of pelagic birding and looking for mammals too, while also taking in glaciers too. So we, we usually go to Northwestern Glacier, which is kind of the furthest one out, uh, pursuing uh, birds like Kitlitz's mulet, which is kind of the scarcest one, pigeon guillemot, uh, this rhinoceros auklet here. Um, this is marbled murelet. And we've also got a good chance of sea mammals like Stella sea, sea um, lion. <laughs> Sorry, I almost said Stella seagull, which is a Japanese bird. Sorry about that. So Stella sea lion um, and humpback whales. 
um, along with those uh, orclets and we often see tufted and horned puffins on this trip as well so it's a kind of siege on the senses for seabirds with a few odd mammals too and some great scenery like these glaciers so um, yeah it's a really cool day it's a full day on a very comfortable boat and um, yes it's kind of one of the highlights of the trip straight up Fishing. part one we enter part two so we've had a night in anchorage uh, two nights in Seward, then another night in Anchorage, and now we fly to Nome and we get settled in for a four-night stay. This is 540 miles, uh, more or less, from Anchorage, so it takes uh, an hour and a half or so on a plane, so we do it by flight, and then we settle in in this small town of Nome, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere, but at the centre of everywhere when it comes to birding. Um, so here's a, an interesting map. Um, one of the things that people always say about Nome is there's no place like Nome. Uh, that's particularly true of birders. I don't think you'll ever forget it if you go there and you'll be desperate to go back, as am I. Um, one of the cool things is it's a place with roads to nowhere. Yeah, so it has three main roads and that's it, um, apart from a few little extra ones in town. So you have, these are all famous birding roads. They're all about 70 miles long. You have the Teller Road going northwest out of Nome, the town. Then you have the Kugarak Road, that's one going straight north. And then you have the Counter Road going out to the uh, northeast. And these all have kind of different character to them. So for example, on the Teller Road, you can go and see things like Bartel Gobwits on the nesting grounds, Red Knot. Um, sometimes they have Pied Wagtail breeding along there. Um, along the Kugarak Road, you've got the famous Coffee Dome where you can climb up to the hill and make your attempts at seeing the bristle-thighed curlew, one of the rarest shorebirds in the world, where this is one of the best places to see it. And then the Counter Road is interesting because it goes through Safety Sound where you've got things like breeding Aleutian Terns on the edge of town. Um, and then you have the actual sound itself, which is packed with sea ducks, seabirds, um, divers or loons as they say and then eventually it passes through oh and packed packed with sh uh, shorebirds on the sea uh, on the shoreline sorry and then when you go further along the council road you get into like coniferous forests near the end so you can get things like bohemian waxwings um, breeding warblers like black pole warbler and stuff so you've got a huge vari variety here and four nights will definitely not feel like enough yeah, things like blue throat and arctic warper breeding the scrub around town. Ah, it's just an amazing place. There's just birds to be seen everywhere, right in town and beyond. So like a lot of the places in Alaska, the moment you step out your door, wherever you're staying, there's birds available and mammals too. Um, so it's a, it's, there's history of its former gold mining sort of, uh, well, it's gold mining history in Nome. It's got one of the largest gold pans in the world. Right on the edge of town, as I say, you can get a Lucian Turns. So it's a great place to see that. Also right on the edge of town, you get long-tailed Jaegers or skewers to uh, us Europeans. Sorry about that. Um, and then, yes, uh, in the scrub around town, you can see and hear regularly wa uh, Wilson's warbler singing. It's one of the characteristic sounds of the scrub around Nome. And in the same kind of patches, you also find the golden crowned sparrow. And sparrows don't always get ex don't always get people excited, but this is a pretty cool looking one. And I'm going to give you a song here because it's a it's a beautiful sound. So yes, our time out of Nome is spent basically birding along the roadsides, walking off the roadsides on those three principal roads that go to nowhere. Um, the middle road, the Kugurok Road, is the one we go, excuse me for my bad pronunciation, no doubt. Um, I'm British, just give me, a, give, me, give me a break on that one. But anyway, that's the one we go to Coffee Dome uh, to look for the uh, bristle-thighed curlew. On the way there, we can stop on roadside scrub to look for blue throat and look for Arctic warblers. And, you know, we could see moose and bears and things like that. So we're always on the lookout for mammals too. And when you're on the top of the hill, it can be pretty brutal and windy. Uh, the climb up's a few hundred meters. And then we're looking for things like rock ptarmigan here. Um, I'm going to give you the call of the rock ptarmigan to get you going.
the focus of going to that spot where I just played you the rock ptarmigan. We're really looking for the bristle-thighed curlew, one of the rarest birds of the trip. It's an endangered shorebird with some kind of unique characteristics. Um, it looks a bit like a wimbrel, but, uh, and there are wimbrel there just to test your patience when you're looking for this one. Um, but this is a ri ridiculous uh, shorebird. It's endangered, probably under 4,000 breeding pairs. There's two small populations in Alaska, and then they go and winter entirely on the Pacific islands and atolls, places like Hawaii and Pitcairn, which is the only shorebird to do that. The other thing that's the only shorebird known to do is become completely flightless for two weeks each year when they molt. Uh, all other shorebirds are known to, uh, thought to be able to fly during that period. So they become ridiculously open to predation during that period um, when they're molting in the South Pacific. And um, it's also the only shorebird known to use tools. It uses rocks and drops things like bits of coral on seabird eggs to, pry the, to break them open and eat what's inside. So that's the only known tool using seabird, uh, shorebird so far. Um, so yes, so here's the call of the bristle tag curlew, which we look for up on the coffee dome. So as we go around the area, we take in a lot of shorebirds, and this is one of the great breeding shorebirds, the bar-tailed godwit. This is the world champion of migration. Um, so I have to read this out for you because it's quite staggering the facts and I'll only get the figures wrong. So this bird only breeds in Alaska. So if you want it for your North American list, this is the very best place for the bar-tailed godwit. And why it's remarkable is in 2007, a particular female Bartogovic, tagged as E7 and satellite tracked, uh, flew non-stop from Alaska after breeding in Alaska to its wintering grounds in New Zealand. This took eight days and is a distance of 7,270 miles. This is the longest non-stop flight ever recorded. So um, yeah, an absolute world champion of migration. Um, so let's be clear, it flew eight days without stopping a non-stop flight and yes as we roam the tundra here so we we will basically be doing road birding looking for a lot of these birds in the road and we'll get a lot of them it's excellent road birding around Nome um, as I say there's three roads of about 70 miles long each so there's plenty of ground to cover and uh, we'll be looking on the shoreline for shorebirds of course around safety sound where we can get loons and um, sea ducks, seabirds, things like that, but also we go out on the tundra. So there's there's shorelines packed with shorebirds, but there's also mountains where there's scatterings of breeding shorebirds and they're fun to find and they're quite camouflaged and they're really interesting landscapes. This is the Red Knot. Just some uh, throwback to some of Gnome's uh, mining times. Um, there's some evidence of that in various places. And here's a classic example. I'll just get my mug off the screen here. So here's the actual um, landscape below of the surf bird. Um, that's where they breed. This is a picture of one on the coast nearby. And that breeding ground is also where we can see the northern wheat ear, which is a rare um, Alaskan uh, breeding bird. So, sorry, rare North American breeding bird, which you really have to go to Alaska for. So that's a really cool uh, landscape to be looking for an interesting shorebird and look for wheat ears too and raptors too, of course. Uh, breed around the area. So yes, this is the surf bird on its breeding grounds. And nice to see there. You can see them on the coastline with the thousands of shorebirds there, but it's nice to see them on the tundra while you're looking for birds like wheat ear. Uh, this is American gold plover. Um, you can see them at several sites on this tour. Um, lovely to see them with their black bellies at this time. Um, and you can get also black belly plover and breeding plumage around here and also Pacific golden plover so it's a, a good way to rack up your golden plovers on this trip. Uh, yeah so the, the 
when we do the council road, which is that road that was leading northeast, um, we go past Safety Sound, looking at all those shorebirds along the shoreline. Things like black turnstone surfbirds can be there. Um, you know, things like Western sandpipers, Dunlin, and and also you're looking off the sea for things like Arctic loon, one of the rarer loons, or sea ducks like Idas, uh, common Idas, for example. Um, but as you make your way through the tundra away from the coast, um, then you start looking. You get Jaegers in the tundra. You get uh, blue throats in the scrub. Arctic warblers in the scrub, and then you work your way up towards uh, coniferous forest uh, near council itself at the end of the road. And that's where you can get things like this bohemian waxwing, uh, breeding yellow rumped or myrtle warbler, black pole warbler, which is a breeder there. The black pole warbler is one of the longest distance, well, it is the longest distance uh, migrant warbler in the North America. So breeds in the Amazon and sometimes gets as far south as Argentina. Sorry, winters in the Amazon, I should say, and sometimes winters as far south as Argentina, but then goes and breeds way up in Alaska. So it's got a pretty cool history, that one. And orange crown warbler is also a, a notable uh, warbler you can often get up there. Um, so the other thing is you travel the other roads, like there's the Teller Road where you can get um, other birds like Another specialty is the Eastern Yellow Wagtail on the bottom right. Actually, you can get that one right around Nome itself, so that's quite easy to find, actually. It's in Jaeger breeding habitat, so while you're looking for long-tailed Jaegers, uh, which are a bit more visible, uh, you keep an eye out for those guys too. Uh, the Pied Wagtail, or White Wagtail in the middle, is a lot rarer, uh, but they, they quite often have a pair or two breeding along the Teller Road, which is that road that goes north uh, northwest out of town. <laughs> And this was taken back on the counter road. Um, you have a lot of nice valleys here, which are good for raptors. Um, so you're looking, you're always on the lookout for golden eagles. Some years they've got well-known nest sites they use. Uh, interestingly, some of the raptors in this area, um, they, they sort of compete for nest sites. So some years you'll find the same nest with a different raptor in entirely. This is kind of one of the kind of scenes along the council road, that north uh, east road, um, where you get further out, where you get, you know, as I say, it goes for 70 miles or so. Uh, but once you get about 40 miles out or so, you can start getting into this stuff, which is raptor country. So you're on the lookout for them, but you're also on the lookout for one of the most impressive raptors in uh, Alaska and the Arctic is the gyre falcon, the biggest of the falcons. So uh, this one, as you can see, was nesting on a bridge. So that was quite good for one year. Uh, it does regularly nest on the bridge, but as I say, the, the, all, some of the raptors in the area, they kind of they kind of compete for the same nesting spot. So um, sometimes uh, you go to the same nest a different year and there's a different bird setting up, different species. Um, so they're obviously it's obviously prime uh, real estate, as they say. And as I've been mentioning, you know, the safety sound itself uh, along the beginning of one of the roads is crammed with ducks like these common eiders. You've got the Lucian terns breeding around there. You've got a lot of plovers along the shoreline. It's a good place to look for rarities, like regular rarities like lesser sand plover and redneck stint particularly. That's one that turns up on a regular basis. And as you go around, this is one of the common mammals of the area, the Arctic ground squirrel. As I say, in this area, we could also get moose. Uh, one of the main animals we're looking for, of course, is the musk ox. This was awesome, this one leaping up in the air. Um, so Dome's an excellent place to see that on various of the various roads, uh, along with the moose. So yeah, so it's a good place for animals. Sometimes you get bears as well. So chance of bears, moose, musk ox, ground squirrels. Uh, so yeah, there's always oh, foxes, of course. And that brings us to the end of uh, round two or part two, which was the gnome section. So to recap, We've done one night in Anchorage, two nights in Seward, one night in Anchorage again, and then four nights in Nome before returning to Anchorage before we fly to Barrow, the northernmost, uh, uh, which is part of the northernmost point of uh, in North America. So yeah, now we enter part three of our 14 day main tour uh, in Alaska. So this is exciting this bit because we fly 720 miles, about three hours flight from Anchorage to Barrow in the north. Um, point Barrow is the actual northernmost point of North America, they say. Um, this is a town that feels like the middle of nowhere. Um, absolutely awesome. The moment you step out of the door, you're seeing birds on your doorstep and there's all kinds of exciting possibilities. I should mention, and I apologize for the pronunciation, it's officially been renamed after its local Inuit name, which is Utkjavik. And if I've got that wrong, Utkjavik, 
I'm very sorry, it's a very hard word to get right. But to most Americans, it's traditionally been called Barrow, uh, partly because it's easy to say, I'm sure. So I'll refer to it as Barrow, um, but officially its name's, its name's been reverted to its old uh, local Inuit name, Utkivik. <laughs> So let's, uh, let's move on with that. So as you arrive in Barrow, the f some of the first birds you notice just around town um, are, are snow buntings. Um, and one thing I should say about uh, Barrow is it's, it's so far north, there's often a lot of ice and snow there, uh, including sea ice. And the conditions that ice change year to year a little bit. Um, and yeah, so, so it's, it's kind of critical, the timing of this tour, um, early June in my, my opinion being best, um, because because of the ice there can often be late. Uh, if you go too early in the season, you risk some of the areas being frozen and therefore some of the key ducks you wanna see and water birds, they actually haven't got anywhere to settle down. They'll be around, they'll be flying around looking for open areas, but you might not be able to get to them. So um, there's known spots where they open up earlier, so you know where to go, but uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting for the timing. And also right around town, these are just town birds, I'm telling you, uh, snowy owls. So there's often a snowy owl pair that breeds uh, near town. And I think almost everyone loves a snowy owl. It's one of the best birds in the world, in my opinion. But I'm biased because I have a total obsession with owls. Um, you can also get short-eared owls around here. They're often around as well. Another town bird is Lapland Longspurs. As you can see, they look amazing this time of year. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one that's hopping around the streets in town along with the snow buntings. And any little pool you can find, you often find shorebirds like this Western Sandpiper. Um, so shorebirds, you don't really have to find them, they find you. They're just everywhere in Barrow. And it's a really exciting experience because the air is filled with shorebird noise and the views are filled with shorebirds and often extremely close. Uh, shorebirds are not particularly shy. I mean, even on their, in any other areas, even when they're breeding, they, they might be shy immediately around the nest, but uh, where they're actually kind of feeding, they're often very easy to photograph, like this Western Sandpiper and like this Dunlin here. This is another kind of Sandpiper, which you may have only seen as a drab gray bird, but in summer they get this chestnut back, this ginger kind of cast to the upper parts and this black belly patch. And for me, this is one of my favorite shorebirds of the trip. And you probably think that's odd. You're probably looking at the screen at a brown bird and thinking, what are you on, Sam? Well, you've got to see them in display flight. And that's what makes this incredible. It has an amazing display flight and it has an amazing display sound. It booms. I mean, literally booms. So I'm going to put you on screen a picture of the display bird in display flight and then play you the booming call. It's, it's awesome. And they often drop right next to you when they do it. So it's, it's just like a comical scene that puts this shorebird in a completely new light. You enjoyed that booming pectoral sandpiper and realize that bird's a bit better than you may have thought it was if you've never been here before. Or hopefully it's brought back some memories for those of you who have. Um, so yeah, some of the more attractive shorebirds you could argue are the things like the red phalarope. Now these are unbelievably common in Barrow. I mean, if you decide to bring waders with you, which is a good idea if you wanna kind of walk out into the tundra and kind of get close up shots of more of these birds, um, there's no need to do that. You can get good stuff from the road, but some people like to do that to, to stalk some particular birds. And um, yeah, you can get amazing pictures of red phalaropes. As you walk through kind of really sort of like a few inches deep water, you're literally walking in amongst lots of spinning red phalaropes and red neck phalaropes. This is, it's an amazing scene that was just one of the things that I, I, I just never realized how common they would be. And that's one of the beauties of these birds. And here's both of those phalaropes together. And this is a this is not an unusual shot. <laughs> um, this is a shot you can get day in Dallas and Barrow at this time of year in June. Another one of a pair of red phalaropes there. Phalaropes, I should say, in case you're unaware of this, they're one of these uh, weird birds where the the bird on the left is a female because it's the brighter and more attractive bird. So they kind of have different roles than other birds, with the uh, male having the duller plumage. Uh, which is often not the case. Uh, this is a common bird around Barrow. You'll see Glaucus wing, sorry, 
Glaucus gulls, I should not say that, that's wrong. Um, you can get Glaucus gulls all around town. Um, so they're quite common to come across. And as you go around town, you can even get things like polar bear. Um, there are polar bears on Point Barrow. I managed to see one last time at about two in the morning on my own, uh, when the uh, sensible people were in bed. <laughs> Um, yes, willow tarbigan breeds around the edge of town as well, so they're, they're looking at the best at this time of year. Um, we got the great photographs of this one. They're often displaying as well, which is cool. So, um, but probably the stars of Barrow are the northern sea ducks. Um, the, you know, the, I've talked about the brevity of the breeding season of some of these birds in in the Arctic, and this is well north of the Arctic Circle in Barrow. So, birds like this Stelazida, you have a really narrow window to get them each year. They come in for a few weeks. They find the first water they can find go and breed and then they get the hell out of there again so um, to get them at the best um, it's typical to go sort of late May early June early June being my preference to be honest and it's not the only Ida in town uh, this is the King Ida uh, people argue about the best sea duck and, uh, and to be honest out of these three Idas I, I just can't tell you uh, the rarest one of the three is this this spectacled Ida uh, we saw them earlier on this is the best place for it um, absolutely amazing photograph taken by Ian Campbell I believe here um, so yeah, th those sea ducks are probably some of the biggest draw cards while you're looking for low, while you look at loads of shorebirds, you're going to get loons, there's some feeders in town where you can get red poles of several species, um, you're looking for long spurs around town, snowy owls, shorted owls. So yeah, there's, there's plenty to look for in beautiful landscapes and uh, at a place that feels like the top of the world. So yeah, <laughs> once we've finished our three nights in Barrow, or Utkiewicz, if that's anywhere near realistic of how to say it. Uh, apologies again for butchering it. Uh, we fly back to Anchorage for a final night if you're not joining an extension. However, I recommend everybody to carry on and not make that your final night. And we'll get to why in a minute. So after the final night at Anchorage, where we say goodbye to some, but hopefully none, um, hint, 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 um, we fly to St. Paul, which is 770 miles from Anchorage going southwest in the Pribilof Islands. Uh, we just visit the one island there. It's a flight of about four hours. Um, and the moment you get there, you'll instantly understand why you have to be there. Um, I said this trip is good for nature lovers. I've said this trip is good for bir hardcore birders looking for specialities. Um, and I've got to make the point that it's amazing for photographers the whole trip, but particularly on St. Paul. Um, so anyone even who has a casual interest in bird photography, St. Paul is going to blow your mind. I mean, literally, it's arguably one of the best places to photograph certain seabirds in the world, um, certainly in North America, but you could argue beyond that for sure. So it's a simple place, St. Paul, and this is the simple hotel. There's a bit of a hint on the sign of one of the birds you're looking for, the horned puffin. And right around the accommodations, you could see this guy, the gray crowned rosy finch. It's actually a distinct subspecies. Um, it's the biggest one of them all, uh, confined to the Pribilofs. So who knows what they'll do with it in the future. Maybe they'll make a species out of it if we're lucky. But anyway, it's really cool because it's very common on the island. A lot of things are very common on the island. So you don't have to work hard for the birds at all. You kind of drive around dirt roads and just stop wherever you see a bird. And then there's key spots for breeding birds, of course. Uh, but this bird you don't have to make any effort for, you will find it probably in the yard as you check into the hotel. Another bird you have to make zero effort for, the rock sandpiper. In my opinion it's one of the commonest birds on St Paul. Um, and the neat thing about this time of year is you might see these guys too. Uh, on the top of the rock there you've got the beautiful uh, chick of the rock sandpiper so that's a cool thing to see I mean they're just all over the island and this is their habitat here of the rock sandpiper this is a typical environment on St Paul where you might find them um, St Paul is also famous for its rarities um, earlier in the season is often better for rarities but you can get them anytime of course rarities uh, break the mold um, but uh, we go there principally for the breeding birds um, because that's that's the highlight and that's what you're going to photograph and you're guaranteed to see but you're always on the lookout for rarities, you just never know. Uh, this is one of the common birds on the island, Pacific Wren. Uh, Pacific Wren's also a main in Alaska, and we could well see it there, but they seem to be a lot more visible on St. Paul where there's such little vegetation. So, um, And I, I just love the call of wrens, so I'm going to give you a bit of a snapshot of the Pacific Wren here. Um, it's kind of illustrating what it's doing on the screen here. Over to the St. Paul version of the 
Pacific Rim. Hope you enjoyed the Pacific Rim. Um, so as I've been trying to ram down your throat throughout this trip is it's a good natural history trip as well as going after specialty birds and photographing things. And St. Paul is an excellent place to see northern fur seal colonies um, which have a distinct smell of their own and uh, photograph them too. Um, this one looks particularly angry. So yeah, the, the mammals don't dry up on St. Paul. You've actually got things like uh, foxes on St. Paul and stellar sea lions offshore. So, um, so yeah, while you're also looking for nesting seabirds on the place, there are also things moving offshore. Sometimes you even get whales like orcas there. So yeah, there's a lot to look for on St. Paul away from the obvious thing, which is the nesting seabirds. Um, ducks. Ducks are always a big feature of this tour, as I've said, and St. Paul's no different. It's lovely to see these flotillas of harlequin ducks, one of the most attractive ducks in the world for sure. Mixed in here, we've got a few uh, rogue long-tailed ducks uh, seeming to have an identity crisis. And this is kind of a picture of one of the valleys in St. Paul. This is the kind of area as you can see, there's not much tall vegetation. So to find any rarities, you often sort of comb these valleys, seeing if anything kind of pops up from behind a rock. Uh, the most regular things being snow buntings and rosy finches, um, but sometimes you get a rarity too, and rock sandpipers are everywhere. As I said, you can get uh, Arctic foxes on St. Paul. You also get them on the mainland, so it's not exclusive to there. And then this is the kind of main draw card of St. Paul, and this is the region I urge everybody to go. I mean, it's just a sensational place to see and photograph seabirds. If you look carefully on the picture here, I'll just put my arrow next to him. Here's uh, one of the local guys, Phil. I do not advise you to do this at home, but he got some damn good shots from it. So we won't be doing it quite like that, but we will get amazing views inevitably anyway. So um, we don't have to risk our lives there like Phil did. Um, that was his choice. <laughs> And on the cliffs we get specialties like the red leg kitty wake. Look at the leg colour there. Um, on the boat trip we have a good chance of seeing, um, we may have already seen this one, the black leg kitty wake, but the red leg kitty wake is actually a specialty of St Paul. So we have a chance at both of those, both uh, red legged and black leg kitty wake on this trip, type of gull. Of course the hotel sign tipped us off about one of the main seabirds we came to see and photograph the horned puffin. So that's really cool. And then, you know, orcs are the key thing here. So it's all about the orcs. It's kind of like an attack of the orcs, if you like. And this is one of my favorites, the crested orclet. Take a good look at that bill and that biz bizarre little headdress it has. I mean, this is, this is probably my favorite bird on St. Paul, which you might have problems with when I show you one shortly, uh, but it's that kind of place. Everything grabs your attention sort of by the scruff of the neck. Um, you don't have to make much effort. Here's the crested orclet close up. So, looking for that crest there. This was taken by Keith Barnes, making me jealous there. Um, and here's a parakeet orclet. So, it's just this the, the, the seabird cliffs are just packed with birds muirs, orclets, uh, fulmar, um, kitty wakes, the gulls, as I say. And then offshore, you can get things like the sea lions, sometimes whales like orcas, as I say. So, it's a place where a lot of stuff's going on. Um, here's another picture of the parakeet orclet, this time one of my own. And um, one of the orclets particularly likes these kind of little bars of uh, rocky areas. So this is the least orclet, probably the cutest one. Um, again, vying for attention to best seabird among this uh, stellar cast. Here's one in close up on the side of the cliffs. So you've got crested orclet there, you've got least orclet, you've got parakeet orclet, you've got horned puffin, you've got red leg kittiwake. Um, Northern Fulmer, and then you got this guy. For me, one of the best birds of the trip, um, the tufted puffin. Um, so, you know, imagine you're sitting on this cliff, um, typically alone. This is not a crowded place. A lot of birders go there, but it's quite spaced out. We tend to go a little later in the season than some because we want the birds to be, in case there's a late breeding schedule, we want to get them um, at the most busy time when they're going to and from the cliff like this tufted puffin. And you can also get nice headshots to go with it too. This is my single favorite shot on my last, shot on my last trip, I should say. Um, so yes, so that 
that and then you spend your three nights so after you've done your three nights in St Paul you fly back to Anchorage for the end of the trip so I'd just like to say um, thank you to Keith Barnes and Ian Campbell for use of their photographs I wanted to end on this group of flowers because uh, it is amazing blossoms and blooms at this kind of season, combined with amazing landscapes, combined with speciality birds, combined with mammals, um, combined with just uh, an utterly unique wildlife experience. Um, guides just love guiding this trip and there's a good reason for it. Um, you're not going to get me declining any, any uh, uh, chance of guiding this trip anytime soon and I'm sure of that for every one of our guides who've been there. Uh, we have a long history of going there and we all are desperate to get back. So I hope you enjoyed this Alaska virtual tour and I would like to also say thank you for supporting these virtual tours by watching them and I hope you enjoy them. It really means a lot to me personally, Sam Woods, and to the other guides too. So an extended thank you to all of you. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it.